So I'm here in Liverpool and I'm recording a film for International PKU Day which is 28th of June 2021. I'm going to be showing this a day early actually and the reason I'm in Liverpool is because I'm going to be talking to retired dietitian Christine Clothier. Christine is one of the three people responsible for the very first diet booklet for people with PKU which was written nearly 40 years ago almost Christmas. and uh, I think without further ado we need to turn to Christine and find out more about her I will say this she has been a pediatric dietitian specializing in metabolic dietetics or PKU for 27 years and she helped give um, Professor Anita McDonald some pediatric experience during her training Christine has been a leading light in PKU and made all the recommendations that were very scientifically and carefully calculated out. Those recommendations became a lot more practical and real life when Christine got involved and she's got lots of interesting memories to tell us about. So Christine, tell me about when you first learned about PKU, it was when you were in Leeds, is that right? I learned as a student um, during my year's training, because I didn't go to uh, university, we did um, a year's theory and six months practical work. And we used to go to the uh, nurses training school in Round Hay. And we went one, one afternoon a week for a whole year and I don't remember anything about what we did except this one incident. And they put out for us the protein substitutes Minifen and Simogran, I think were the only two. And also she, she had out for us various things like peppermint and uh, Worcester sauce, tomato, ketchup, things, Marmite, things as a strong taste. And we each had to wear a nose clip, a tight nose clip, and then we tasted the products. And we thought, so, you know, what is all the fuss about? Because you couldn't taste them. It was. So putting, doing this with your nose does have some help. And as soon as we released the nose clip, the smell and taste just came over you. And it was, because we'd have been helping ourselves to so much, it, it was awful. Well, we did, because we, um, they, you know, we kept thinking, really what's all of us about this? Yeah. It doesn't taste of it, you know. So, so then when we released it, it Oh, it was dreadful, all trying to find a drink of water and what have you. But so it's true that if you lose your t sense of um, smell, you also lose your taste. And that was in the early 60s? That would be about, si yeah, that, that was uh, 60, 61, 1961, 6061. And um, then I went to uh, UCH to finish my training. And you were working in a hospital in Hammersmith, the West London Hospital. And in 1964, it was late a, one afternoon. On a Thursday. <laughs> I'll never Friday. forget. No, it was a Thursday. And I was coming down to the office to tidy up to go home. And there on the desk was this note and it said, please provide low phenylalanine diet for patient age six weeks. And if you ever felt like running away, <laughs> it was like when you bumped a car in Asda. And... Um, I just froze. I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Anyway, fortunately, I was friendly with uh, Dorothy Francis at Great Ormond Street. It was always been, I can't say, you know, she always was helpful. She was always willing to help. And she just went through it with me. She told me to, the weight of the baby and how much uh, product to give. And we must have got some, I think they must have sent a tin of Simogram or Minifen over from um, Great Ormond Street because I put the child on a diet that evening. And the next morning, the registrar came to see me and said I'd ruined everything because he thought it would take me weeks to organise the diet and he wanted to take some more samples of blood before they started the diet. And um, I looked after that little boy for about 13 months before I went to Alder Hay. Uh, I just wonder what's happened to him. It would be nice to know. Mm. And so then you came up to Alder Hay and you had... And you, you worked with Dr. Freddie Hudson, who we know was a leading light in PKU. Well, he, he, he was one of those that would say, have a go. I mean, um, 
When they started to treat children with phenylketonuria um, at the 50s, the late 50s, and he, he must have been interested enough to see what he could do. And he and the biochemist were working at Alder Hay, and he knew me as a personal friend, well, he knew my parents. And he sent me a letter and said, what was I doing working in London when they needed a dietitian in Alder Hay? And I thought it was just a joke because I didn't think he really meant it. And the next time I came home, my mother said, oh yes, she said, give him a ring. And that's how it came about. And um, he had to convince the, the board that they wanted a dietitian because um, consultants at that time didn't un understand dietetics. And when I went to work there, they thought I'd just come to do, you know, get the children to lose weight um, and perhaps encourage some to put on weight. The nursing staff, the consultant, most of them didn't know. But of course, he was the doctor for diabetes as well as PKU, so he needed a dietitian. Mm -hmm. And that, that, I wasn't interviewed. Or, well, I was interviewed, but it was. Uh, they knew that you were had a bit about you. I don't know. They, 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 the thing is, it was all done, really, because um, there was never any competition for a job in those days. Mm. I mean, I was lucky to work at that time. There was no competition. You're a very practical dietitian, aren't you? So um, you, when you were, you were very empathetic, and Freddie Hudson was very empathetic. He was, he was, yeah. Him situation that the families were in and this diet that they had to do. Can you tell me more about what was the diet actually like in 1965 or the, the, thereabouts? I was being educated by Grace, uh, by Grace Ormond Street yeah. because uh, <clears throat> I didn't know anybody else and I was lucky to know Dorothy and uh, for, Dorothy was very strict with the diet and the consultant Freddie Hudson that I worked for had empathy with children on diet and he said to me weighing all these vegetables because we weighed cabbage and stalks of if you saw the, uh, the Great Ormond Street diet sheet a large stalk of cabbage or um, two celery sticks and and how big is a large leaf of cabbage it's very difficult and so he said that we would allow most of the vegetables freely, obviously not potatoes, bananas in those days we used to count. And what we did, we counted them as five portions. Mm -hmm. So if somebody was on eight portions, they ended up on three, mm -hmm. but they didn't realise that we were counting the vegetables. Mm -hmm. So it just gave them just a tiny bit of freedom. And then they only had to weigh set things. Potatoes and, and, and things like that. Yeah. But they were actually counting the fruit and vegetables, but they weren't aware of it. And it, it worked. I mean, the the, um, the, the blood tests were, were excellent, so it worked. But it was a good idea. And, and tell us about what the children that you looked after, what did they think of their amino acids? Because they was, they was cymogram and minifen still at this stage. We actually used Albumade because um, the, the firm was local. No, no, Jerry Milner. Oh. Um, I think it was uh, Paul and Schofield when he first started, and then it became Scientific Hospital Supplies. And he was just reading about phenylketonuria in a, in a magazine or something, and he thought, he was a chemist, and he thought he would be able to produce a product that commercially, I suppose. But when he produced this product, it was so high in salt and um, so he brought it to Alder Hay just for the biochemist and the consultant to have a look at. So Freddie Hudson and Joe Allen became very much um, a team with SHS. And so we always used Albumade XP because, um, and they were very good to us, the dietitians and the biochemists would regularly visit us. And if they were thinking of a new product, they would ask what we thought about it. And uh, so we would, it, you know, give them our advice if you like in turn. But um, what did the patients think of the album aid? What did they do? The, the smell, the, the smell of it was terrible. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe the, the amino acids were better. But I used to tell them to take the lid off the box before they started making the feed. And if you put it in the fridge, if the child was old enough to put it in the fridge, 
and they would take it that way, that makes it better. And the other thing is if you take it through a straw because it goes to the back of your throat and misses all the taste buds in the front. And that's why, well, we found, I don't know about now, that children with PKU wouldn't give up the bottle. Mm, and we decided yeah. it was because that it went, they didn't taste it yes, so much. Yeah. I can smell it now and, and taste it if I think about it. Gosh. It was, it was, um, it wasn't, it wasn't good. And little children, the mummies had to, uh, um, and the mums had to get all sorts of special measures to get this stuff down their children. And they were, you, ha you had mums that told you they did all sorts of things to actually get the stuff, the protein substitute or the amino acids down the child. What sorts of things did they do? It was it was the worst thing that they they had to do the things that mm. um, the things that they did they used bribery and um, various things, but you're thinking about the the parents with the clocks. Um, there was a young mother and the baby, and it had a fascination for clocks when when the chime went off. So the grandparents would set the clocks at various times so it would keep going off, and every time the clock chimed, the child. <gasps> went like that and opened its mouth and the mother put the, the feed in. And the grandfather was quite pleased about this idea. He said it, it really worked. They must have um, had a lot of clocks in their house. Well, they must have gone and borrowed them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I suppose if you were clever enough, you had three clocks, you could keep starting yeah. the, the other one. That's what they told me anyway. And tell us about, in the early 60s, there was pretty much just two two low-protein products? There were just it? two. There was um, wheat starch, which I, I... Do they still have wheat starch? No. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it was a byproduct, wasn't it, of, of flour? Mm. It, it, um, I, I don't really know what... I, th I tell you, um, you remember those rolls that... I've um, forgotten what they were called. They were just full of air. That's what they used to make with it, I think. Mm. So, the there was Juvella rolls. No, it, um, yeah, it's the other way around. I think they used the gluten to make those rolls, and that was the byproduct. That's, I've, told, I've told you wrong. And um, but there were wheat starch, and there was something called Aminex rusks, uh, and that's that's all that we had. And the the free list, the first free list, I wrote by hand, and it had thirty three ingredients on it, oh, mostly yeah. vegetables, uh, wheat starch, and things that they'd never heard of, like um, agar agar, which was a, a jelly. But nobody, the, the parents couldn't afford to make the jelly because in those days it was two pounds a pound. And in 2018, using a pint of lager as a yardstick, I worked it out, it would be 93 pounds a pound. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very expensive. So the children only got the jelly when they were in hospital because I bought it. Um, and then there was something called um, uh, glucona delta lactone, and that was something that came from Australia. It came with, I, we had it here, it was used in the bakering trade, but the recipe came from Australia. But it came as a commercial recipe, and we had to break it down and make it into you know, a household recipe. Um, Edifacé was something that they made, you know, some oh. cases they went eggs, they made it Edifacé. Mm. And I, the first time I used it, I made so many meringues. I think if the hospital was still there, you probably would be able to find the meringues that I made in 1965. Um, <laughs> Did anyone eat them? Well, uh, do you know, I can't remember that. We, we were always um, having ideas to do things. Mm. I think so. They probably did, but um, it's so, it's, things are so much better now. Thank, thank goodness that it's so much better now. Cause it was, you, you have made rolls, haven't you? Um, can you tell me about how you tried to break it up with the Oh, that was the gin. Well, you see, well, there was no recipes. There was no recipe. There was no Eileen Green in those days. Mm. And uh, and so you do it in, in your free time, you know, the weekend or something like that. So I thought, oh, this is easy. I'll just get my mother's recipe book and I'll make cakes for the children with phenylketonuria. So I started with ginger biscuits and I just left out <laughs> all the ingredients that the children couldn't have. Mm. 
and made the biscuits and they looked very nice, but they were like concrete. And so I gave them to the dog and it was like a stone, he, he couldn't eat it. And then we went out into the garden and I had a poker and I hit these ginger biscuits with the poker and it still didn't do anything. It didn't, it didn't break up. No, it didn't, didn't break up. They were just, this is, there's no gluten and you see, there's nothing to make it rise. Yeah. And so they were just, or just soft, hard. Or, or, or be soft, That's or be why I, I you know I admire Arlene Green so much because um, uh, she must have done her own recipe. Mm. She must experiment with things. She's like a magician. Yeah. Well, I wasn't a magician. <laughs> <laughs> Before I came up here, when I was reading back copies of the um, NSPQ News and Views, there was this story about chocolate and Cadbury's chocolate. And did you write to them? I can't, I can't remember. I'd forgotten that story. <clears throat> we got some... Um, low protein chocolate, low phenylalanine chocolate from Cadbury's and it did taste quite nice. Um, and we gave it to the children, which looking back, I think it was a mistake because they only gave us so many samples and once they'd gone, because I think the firms make things for a commercial reason, not always for um, a helpful dietetic reason and so they never made it again and the children who had the chocolate were always asking us at Easter time can we have some of your chocolate so that was very sad but that I, I don't I don't think I don't even know if it went to other hospitals I know they gave it to us in Liverpool mm, it featured in the newsletter I think it was quite uh, hopeful that there would be yeah more, but, but there was there was no more um I'm going to ask you about how you and Dorothy Francis and uh, Jennifer Coots had to do your maths to work out the exchange foods when you wrote the first dietary. Well, when the um, NSPKU was formed, um, we had a meeting, three consultants. I think three people for representing the NSPKU and three dietitians. And at the end of the meeting, of course, the consultants didn't have anything to do. It was the dietitians that had all the work to do. And the first thing they wanted was a list of portions that they could give to pet. Because, you see, some p people didn't belong to a, a major clinic. Mm -hmm. they, they perhaps we had people in rail or places like that. So they wanted to be able to distribute a list of portions. And we used the McCanns and Widdison. And I don't remember now, I think it took five calculations. First of all, you had to get the nitrogen content and that was in grams. And so you do your calculations in grams and then we use something called logarithms. Um, and in the end, we had to convert it back from grams into ounces because nobody knew what grams were. So I think um, each calculation w was about with five different things. And you, you had no... We had no... No calculators. No, calculators, no computers. We honestly did it with our fingers. I, um, we, didn't, we didn't have calculators in those days. And then each one of us passed it on. So I would pass mine to Dorothy or Jennifer and she would pass it on. And then, so we checked each other's figures. It took us over a year to do. And sometimes you were wrong. I was wrong because I, I, I was very disappointed because Jennifer rang and said all your figures are wrong and it, I was quite upset. <laughs> but I, I, I'd used the wrong nitrogen factor and when I was looking for along the line, I'd used the wrong nitrogen mm -hmm. so they had to do them all again. I think that will, I think people watching this will, they will relate to that because there's a lot of numbers in PKU diets and thank God we've got calculators now and phones, phones with calculators. And you've got, they, you've got some sort of um, machine, that there are machinery that does it you, when you feed it in, don't you? Calculate, yes. not a calculator, yeah. a computer, yes. a big computer yes. that yes. does it. But um, no, no, we, we, had to, we had to do it all. On, uh, and you see, the first diet sheets I wrote, I wrote by hand. There were, there were two sheets of full scap. Um, and everything, you, you see, when I went to Alder Hay, 
I should I wasn't very clever. Should have said I'll have to have a secretary, and I never mentioned it. But when you think of physios and occupational therapists, who uses that um, uh, um, a secretary most? But a dietitian. Mm. And I used to bribe the um, you know they'd have a room of, of secretaries, and I used to bribe them with Jacob's Club biscuits. <laughs> But um, you all work long hours, I think. I've got that impression. You were quite often still at the hospital in oh, the was... office or in the milk kitchen giving out the parcels. No, the that, that was, that was one story long. about the um, father. That, yeah. You see, we got to know the pet because we were this only dietitian in the hospital. You got to know everybody. You got to know everybody's birthday and the brothers and sisters. It was, it was a lovely situation. And um, I think that they uh, were used to me. And this particular Thursday, and I was always a Thursday, I uh, stayed behind to try and catch up. And the knock on the door, it was about half past eight, nine o'clock. And um, this father had come in, he'd run out of Albumade or something. And uh, I went and got it for him and he just said, thanks, ta Chris, and he went. And he never sort of mentioned the fact that I was there. But uh, an, an, another story, um, a mother said to me, you know how Anita sends out all the uh, blood results, she used, to, she used to do it, but by phone she does it now. Mm. Well, I had to do it just by ordinary telephone. And of course I did it about five o'clock on a Friday night, because that's when the results came through. Clinic was on Thursday. And not everybody had a telephone. Very few pa parents had telephones. And so you might be ringing the lady next door and then you'd have to wait while they went and got the person. And you couldn't give the answer to the lady next door. So you'd have to put that aside and do it again if she couldn't find them. But what was worse if it was raining or snowing and they'd put their boots on and they'd put their raincoat on and then they'd go next door and you'd have to wait for them to come back. And one day in clinic, this mother said to me, she said, um, you know, Chris, when you ring on a Friday with the results, and I said, yes. Yeah. She said, well, it's not very convenient for us. She said, will you ring on a Saturday? And I was working single-handed, and I said, you know, Mrs. What's her name? I said, I don't actually work on a Saturday, in a very sarcastic voice. She said, well, never mind, but make it after five o'clock. <laughs> so, you know, they were very demanding, some of the uh, parents. But I, I, I thought it was funny. I liked them. And um, I, I think all the all the people who were working in PK, you were very committed. You did work at the weekends sometimes. You had parties. Well, we worked. We worked. Children we worked at home. I mean, we worked. We were. We, the parties where I was um, were really quite stressful, mm. because you you'd have to start about September. And you'd book the nurse's ballroom so nobody else mm -hmm. did, and the Father Christmas outfit, and um, that then you'd have to get the you know the paper hats and the prizes for the children and prizes for parcel the parcel, mm -hmm. and um, all those things had to. Then you had to provide entertainers, and then uh, on the day we had to set up, but we had to put up the tables because they'd all be collapsed, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and decorate the tables. We had to make cr Christmas cakes in advance. So it was quite um, time consuming. Um, and we did it for about, I think the first one was 1979, and we, the last one was about 84. Mm. And then we, we, the team was uh, two catering officers and three dietitians, and in, the departments went as big as, as they are now, so we all got on together as a team. Of course, we needed the catering officers to, be, to make the food. And so <clears throat> we thought it would be easy if we went to the theatre and we went to the pantomime. And SHS was so good to us, we, they provided a lot of the finance for us. So did other firms, but SHS particularly financed these things. So we went to the theatre and each one of us, each adult, had three children to look after. And I held my children so tightly, I, don't, I thought I was going to choke them because to get out of a bus on Lime Street, oh. dark on a, on a, you know, on the afternoon, yes. it's quite dark in the winter. And the Empire takes something like 2,300 seats, so the, the oh. place was milling with adults and children. 
I mean, we got into the theatre, and there were plenty of of the 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 sister from the clinic and phlebotomists, and quite a few, you know, a few the teachers who, from the school who knew the, who knew the patients. So the catering officers didn't know the patients, but they came because they were part of the team. And I didn't know, but they left. They thought they'd go over to one of the pubs. There are lots of pubs in that area, and they'd have a pint. But um, they didn't know, but when they came back, the doors of the Empire in those days were all locked. And the staff in the foyer had gone because they'd locked the, the doors. Mm -hmm. So there they were on Lime Street, which is quite busy, jumping up and down and knocking on the glass. And so a crowd came, and as you can imagine, they offered advice freely about what they should do. <laughs> I don't know how they got in. But somehow or other, somebody, because they had no identification and they had no tickets because the tickets yeah. had gone. But they got in, fortunately, in time for the interval to take the smaller boys to the toilet. Mm. And I think they felt quite um, sort of uh, huffed about, you know, the, the, uh, what had happened. And they took the boys to the toilet and I saw them coming back. And one little boy was quite distressed. And one of the catering officers had him by the hand and I could see he was comforting him and saying things like, you'll be all right when you, you get back and see this now. And as soon as he released the child's hand, the boy fled. And he wasn't one of ours. He was <laughs> They'd gone with eight and come back with nine. Fantastic. Well, I think there's still a fair amount of organised chaos when we have some of our... Um, our parties and the conferences and things. I want to ask you about the NSPKU because it started in 1973 Three, and you were the first artisan to speak at the very first conference. I think, I think Dorothy, the, the, well, the, that was the conference, yes, but they had a meeting, didn't they, the year before and Dorothy, I don't know which, Dorothy and Doug Addy, Doug Addy was at Birmingham and I think they were the speakers, but it, it was just, an, could it be in, um, you know, the yearly annual general yes. meeting. I think oh, that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. And then Freddie Hudson and I spoke in St. Anne's. Yeah. Um, but the, the consultants, there the weren't all that many involved because it was, it was still the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And they weren't keen for the NSPKU to begin. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason was that they themselves weren't really sure how the treatment was going, what had what the treatment would be in the future, whether the children would have to stay on diet for life. So they didn't know a lot about the disorder. Yes, yeah. And if it was parents that were going to make this association and start giving advice when the consultants themselves were unsure, that, that, I think that was the main thing, that we weren't really sure ourselves. And, and of course, we did change our mind about various things. Um, but the, the consultant from Great Or oh, it, it was the um, medical students exams and they were in Liverpool. So the consultant from Great Ormond Street in Manchester were on the examining board and they were there and our consultant was there. And so all we just did was bring the dietitians in. So we had the three dietitians and the three consultants and that was the first meeting. I think it was just three representative from the NSPKU. And that was the, um, and John Noble Nesbitt was one of them, Brian Smith, he was one. And I don't, I can't remember who the other person was. He, I, I do know when I see the I notes, because... Gary Chesterway or somebody like that. No, it's somebody who's still there, I think. Mm. I can't remember. You'd have, you'd have to look, you'd have to see who it was. But um, I'm afraid to say the consultants weren't keen and they said, that the dietitians would meet twice a year with the NSPKU members and the consultants would meet once a year and they never turned up again. They weren't happy and um, I think that was... I, we were, but we did, we got other consultants, the consultants from Bristol, he was very keen. Um, so it did sort itself out. So, the dietitians were the bridge so we were, we were, we were, we were the ones who, who, and that was when we had to do the work for um, making the, the food lists, yeah. the free foods. Mm. So that was the beginning of the NSPKU. And will be fifty. NSPKU will be fifty in a couple of oh, years' time. Yes. That's hard to believe. 
in times past. I can same. see where we had the first. I can see where we had the first meeting on A three. But because um, we were the meetings with the dietitians, I think the, the the beginning they were all held at Alder Hay. I know you you asked me about John Noble Nesbitt. Um, I'll never forget. It was a meeting in January, I think it was, and it had snowed all day. And you see, people didn't have mobile phones. Well, it was easy to ring Manchester. It was easy to ring Grace Ormond Street because we did have phones there. And I'm sure I did try and get hold of John. And suddenly the office door opened and then he came all covered in snow carrying his briefcase. And he'd come all the way. From Norwich? Uh, yes. And, um, in a blizzard? And then he went home. Because no one was there? No. Well, I was there to say, but it had been cancelled. But um, I just re I just remember him coming in, and he I was, thought, yeah. He had tenacity, and he was committed. So he was coming. He came up by car. Yeah. Mm. Um, changing the subject ever slightly. What did you think of Call the Midwife? Because we are very happy that it's got a bit of recognition. With I was uh, waiting in anticipation to see what they do. It was already to get ready and criticise. And I thought it was good. I thought there were some things that uh, the child who, I don't know how they would show how uh, the children who hadn't been treated were, um, but the, they didn't just lie quietly like that. They, no. they tended to be a bit aggressive. Yes. Um, and I wished they did. If you knew what to look for, they had, I'm sure they had meat, fish, eggs and cheese on the table. But if if they'd gone in on that, I, I um, that would have been nice if they'd yes, really I shown how very that's difficult that's the that's diet that's was. Um, but I I I, I thought I, I don't think you could criticize. And things wished that they had done, but I don't think you can criticize what they did. Except they didn't. What did they call it? They didn't call it phenylketonuria. They did you say phenylketonuria? Fen something like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, okay. that's nothing. But I was already, you know. Yeah. ready to say and I thought it was done very well. I did use some of your notes when uh, oh, you sent them to the script writer. Yeah, but oh. sworn to secrecy, couldn't tell anyone. <laughs> but um, they had lots of information. In the end, they chose to focus on that reaction of getting the diagnosis and that being stunned and it was quite emo it was sensitively done. I, they, I thought, that, you know, for people who d didn't understand BKU, it, it was done yeah. well enough.